We all we all exit pretty quickly. Okay. Um, I'm just give me a moment. I'm gonna get in touch with the TV folks. at the back when I did that. It's no mullet. <laughs> no, it, there's too little. It, once it's already off of the head, right? So yeah, there's too little hair. Scott, I'm not. Scott, I'm not sure if you have my email address because I'm looking and I didn't get. I saw the attachment from Matt. I think you were there. I'll uh, resend. For some reason. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking now to see if I can. Uh, I just know that we do have the uh, Ted just joined us. So uh, Matt, I don't think we need to worry about a uh, quorum at all at this point. Thanks a lot, Ted. Now we got to spend the next few hours with each other. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. <laughs> To the extent we're like, how about once we get to the first agenda? Flag that for math purposes at the. In a moment, you call the, the roll uh, and we report you as present. And then you just affirmatively announce that for items 3A and, and the agenda up in front of me that you're going to yep. recuse yourself. Okay. And then you could, you could turn your video off. And then, Matt, if you want to text her when she's back so she's still participating, she's just not uh, an active member in these two uh, discussion items. And we have another uh, member, Mr. Bush, just joins.
keep your microphone on mute so we don't pick up too much background noise. Um, Matt's going to, when we open the hearing here, open the meeting. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to mute you now, Julie. Uh, Matt, the TV says whenever you're ready to go, we can go. So uh, if you're ready to read the script, we can we can start the meeting. Ready to read the script. Let me just let her know we're going. Okay, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to August 31st, 2020 regular virtual meeting of West Hartford Conservation and Environment Commission. Uh, this is our call to order. I'm Matt Masunas, chair of the Conservation Environment Commission. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's virtual meeting. Uh, the required meeting agenda and application materials are all available on the town website. Uh, because in-person attendance at public meetings is likely to increase the transmission of COVID-19, this hearing is being conducted in accordance with Governor Lamont's Executive Order Number 7B. For the record, I will now call the roll. Uh, Ted Newton. Uh, Jessica Schaefer-Helmecki. Present. This doubles as an audio uh, check. Uh, Emily Scott. Present. Matt, I just wanted to say I verbally said present, but realized I was on mute before. So now I'm just confirming I'm present. Confirmed. <laughs> Not only in visions, but uh, in voice. Welcome, Ted. Thank you. Um, Sean Daly. Here. Rick Bush. Present. Did I, did I hear background children there? <laughs> um, Emily Sexton. Not present. And Stephanie Keohain. Not present tonight. And that concludes the call of the roll. Uh, for the record, I'd like to know we do have quorum of the commission. Commission members and town staff are participating by WebEx tonight. Members of the public can view the meeting live on West Hartford Community Television or on West Hartford uh, Community Interactive Comcast Channel 5 and Frontier TV Channel 6098 or at www.whctv.org. The meeting is also being recorded for on-demand viewing, which will be available on the town website. Because of the virtual format of this meeting, there are some special rules and procedures that I need to cover before we begin. Uh, first, I ask all participants to please mute the microphones on your devices when you're not speaking. Second, pursuant to Executive Order 7B, all speakers must state their name and title each time they speak. Also, and if you need clarification on title, uh, let me know. You may simply say, Commissioner. Uh, all speakers must state their name and title each time they speak. Also, I will ask members of the Commission and the applicant to not address other participants directly. Questions and requests for information must be made through the chair. Uh, after, state your name and simply preface your question or comment with, through the chair, and when you're done, I will recognize the person who is most appropriate to respond. Uh, although these practices may feel rigid and awkward, they will ensure the meeting is conducted in an orderly fashion and that members of the public who are listening can understand the discussion. I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone in advance for your patience. This is our first virtual public meeting and there are bound to be some bumps and glitches along the way, but we remain committed to the principles of open and transparent government. Um, with that, uh, the first matter on our agenda tonight is 37 Buena Vista Road application inland wetlands and water courses uh, number 1126 of the town of West Hartford, uh, represented by Julie Vieira, civil engineer, uh, engineering division, requesting approval of an inland wetlands and water courses permit to conduct certain regulated activities, which may have adverse impact on a wetland and water course area. The application seeks permission to dredge and restore a portion of the Trout Brook located at Buena Vista Recreation Facility to improve and restore its flood flow alteration 
uh, function and value. The proposed activity takes place within wetlands, a water course, and adjacent 150 foot upland review area. Uh, will the applicant uh, please proceed with their presentation? Uh, excuse me. Uh, we need to, uh, order. Order. Yeah, thanks. Do we need to do the minutes first, the minutes from last time? Ah, thank you very much. Uh, I skipped that over on the script. Uh, do I have a call for approval of meeting minutes from January 27th, yes. uh, 2020? 27th, so moved. Do we have a second? This is Ted Newton, I'll second that. All in favor, aye. Aye. Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. This has been Emily Scott, commissioner speaking. And now that that's done, I will recuse myself from the discussion of items 3A and 3B. And I'm going to drop out for a while and then we'll rejoin at the appropriate time. Thank you, Emily. Confirmed. Um, Mr. Chairman, Todd DeMay, Tom Planner. Uh, Commissioner Scott, I have the feature. I can put you in a lobby, which is a, oh. a room that's segregated out of participation. So that might be easier Perfect. that I can notify you when we're uh, back off the items you're accused. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, point of order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair recognizes Sean Daly. Uh, Sean Daly, Commissioner. Uh, just uh, don't know if it, it's... Uh, if it's meaningful, but I abstained from that vote since I'm a new member to the uh, commission. Ah. Uh, the record will reflect it and uh, thank you for catching that. Any other points uh, before we get started? All right, second agenda item then, uh, presentation from the town in the wetlands and water courses application. Uh, town staff, you may proceed when you're ready. Okay, I'm going to um, try to see if I could share the plans. Okay. Can everybody see that? I'm seeing a map. Yep. Okay. So my name is Julie Vieira. I'm a, a civil engineer two in the Town of West Hartford Engineering Division. Um, I'm the project engineer for this Buena Vista Channel Restoration Project, which consists of dredging a portion of the uh, open channel of Trout Brook located in the Buena Vista Recreation Area. Um, the, this uh, Buena Vista open channel is an integral part in draining um, the Wood Ridge Lake and the Wood Pond watershed areas. Um, the open channel is located within a part of the Buena Vista Recreation Area, which is owned by the Town of West Hartford. Through the years with um, no maintenance, the open channel has accumulated sediment as well as um, a number of, or a great amount of vegetation growing within the channel. The open channel has lost some of its capacity and it does not have a positive grade downstream to the culvert that crosses under Buena Vista Road. This is evident from the rising water levels um, that breach the channel banks and flow into the pond. Um, there's approximately 740 linear feet of open channel within this um, recreation area. If you just go 740 feet south of Buena Vista Road, um, the amount for this project is only about 225 feet just south of uh, Buena Vista Road. Um, as was mentioned before, the proposed work is in a regulated area and within the 100 year floodplain. So this project came to our attention via the Wood Ridge Lake Association. Um, every year they do their annual drawdown to drain the lake and do their cleanup. And we're not able to complete it last year due to the channel overflowing it, its banks. Um, I'm not really sure, Todd, how the pointing works, but if I put my mouse here, this is the area um, where the channel overflows when they're doing their drawdown. So the focus of this project is to improve the function of how the water is going to flow through this portion of the channel. Um, as I mentioned, it's got a large accumulation of sediment and there's a uh, a number of vegetation that um, is grown in this area. And I, you can see that from the pictures I've shown here. 
it's it's pretty much overgrown. You can't even in some areas you can't really even see where the channel is. Um, so this accumulated sediment with the vegetation has decreased capacity in the channel, and with the less capacity, the banks have started to overflow. Here, there must be a natural area where it just flows into the pond area. Um, and this has caused issues not only for Woodridge Lake Association, but also for our Depart uh, Department of Public Works to do their um, maintenance on the irrigation systems in this um, recreation area. So the goal of this project is to get a positive slope in this area to, to the culvert that goes underneath the road by dredging out the material. Um, the intent is just to dredge the bottom, um, and it ranges, you know, anywhere from maybe a couple inches to maybe a foot. It varies, um, and th that's based on a, the profile that I've shown here, um, the solid line. And as you can see from the solid line, it's a pretty flat gradient. This is taken from the beginning of the open channel to uh, the Buena Vista Road, which is right here. So the straight line is what the bottom of the channel should be, and the dashed line is what the channel is. So you can see that the depth of uh, removal varies. And it's just the bottom. The, the intent is not to touch the banks, just, just the bottom of the channel. Um, to remove that material, and then it is going to, um, the plan is to, you have a couple of stockpile areas shown on the plan to dry out a little bit. And the plan is to take it, um, and place it behind the cornerstone building. As you can see, the southern side of the cornerstone building, I have a like an area designated there. So the material will be placed there and kind of blend it into um, the existing slope that's currently there. Um, we met on site with planning and zoning, and we also hired a soil scientist for this project. We did a wetlands delineation as well as um, functional evaluation and impact report. Um, we also looked at our feasible and prudent alternatives um, to do to do this rest, restoration or to do nothing, which would still, if we did nothing, it would still cause the channel to overflow, um, causing additional um, flooding in the pond as well as additional um, erosion from overflowing the, that bank area there. Um, we do have... Um, our own contractor, the town has a on-call drainage contractor. So we had met out there with our contractor already to explain the logistics of the project. Um, best management practices will perform on all work with sedimentation and erosion controls. Um, we're gonna have to do a, a diversion here. Right now, if you go out there, it's pretty dry. You don't really see any flow in it right now. So we're hoping, um, the, we're hoping to do it in September before October. Um, the Woodridge Lake Association plans to do their drawdown um, beginning October 1st. Um, and right now it's been a fairly dry summer. So right now there's really no flow going in there. So I think at this point, if it, if it stays pretty much like this, we could probably do without having to do any pumping and just divert the flow into the pond and just work it from that way. Um, we are also asking for um, maintenance on this so that we could come back and you know check it yearly and then do do maintenance as we see if it starts accumulating again to to prevent that buildup of sediment as well as that buildup of vegetation so the time frame for the work is probably like a three-week window in there um and then then it, then we should be good to go um the disturbance area it's calculates out to about 200 uh, cubic yards of dredge material, which is roughly, if you just wanna look at the flat surface, it's probably about 456 square yards, just on the flat surface. Um, I think our only pending comment so far, uh, we were requested by the health department to do a rodent survey, um, which we are in the process now of um, hiring a consultant to do that work. So I think at this point, if there's any questions. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I have a point of inquiry. Uh, Chair recognizes Sean, Commissioner Daly. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Um, when was the last time this area was, uh, Commissioner, I'd like to know what, when the last time this area was dredged? Uh, and I believe I will now direct that question to town staff, uh, starting with uh, Ms. Vieira. Um, I've been with the town a little over seven years, and it, it hasn't been done. I don't think it's been done for quite a while. I don't know, Dwayne, if you would know, but. Uh, I don't know if you, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Dwayne Martin, town engineer, just answering Julie's question. I'm not really sure when the last time this area was dredged uh, to its, to its pre-existing uh, slope and size, but obviously with that accumulation of debris, I think it's been quite a uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have follow-up questions, if I if I may. Certainly, please. Um, so, other questions would be then um, if it's if it's been a while, have the recent issues of the overflow uh, just recently come to light, or has this been going on for quite some time? Uh, I'll add on to that with a question I was wondering, which was, uh, when did you notice that grade uh, uh, seeming to uh, have adverse effect and spilling back into the pond? It, was that this past year um, when uh, you had mentioned in the narrative that that was observed? Um, recognizing town staff. The public work department has told us that this has been going on for several years now. It's just, it seems like every year it just keeps continually to get worse and worse over time. So it just, just didn't happen. It just, it's, I think it's the continual buildup of sediment and then it's just, just getting worse. Commissioner Daly? I'll give others a chance to speak, Mr. Chairman, but if not, I do have a couple more questions. Oh, yeah, just when you get a second after Sean, um, I did have one question, but perhaps it will be answered. Uh, the, the other two questions, Mr. Chairman, I have is what's the cost of the project? And um, also, uh, is the feeling um, is that this, this project needs to be done this year, or are there consequences for delaying this project? Interesting line of questioning, and we actually don't usually pass those through to our applicants uh, based on uh, what we observe under what is regulated under wetlands. Uh, I'll certainly allow the question and encourage it. Uh, town staff, please. Okay, so the cost is, is approximately $30,000. And, um, if we if we don't do the project, it's just it it will uh, it will um, still continue to breach the bank there, and it will cause issues upstream um, in regards to the Woodbridge Lake Association's um, yearly drawdown. They will not be able to draw down. It won't it won't handle all that water. Is is the issue with that? So there's knock on effects to that deferred maintenance and it spills over to other properties. Is that the right interpretation? Correct. It spills over into the pond. And so it, it so it's breaching the bank and going over and spilling into the pond. And it also um it also causes issues for the public works department too, because they can't they have um they can't maintain the irrigation system because the water level gets too high in the pond and the water breaches over. And this is Commissioner Schaefer, Helmacki, and uh, through you, Matt, uh, that kind of leads to my question as to, and this might be slightly outside of the scope of the application, but have you noticed any deleterious effects on the pond from the culvert breaching? Uh, town staff, please. Um, just, the, it, just the higher water level and probably... Uh, you know, any erosion between the, the brook and the pond? Okay, thank you. And did I understand correctly that the Woodbridge drawdown was going to 
require diversion to the pond still through you? Uh, um, no, the, the Wood, Wood Ridge Lake drawdown does not require diversion from us. Okay. The, um, the diversion that I show on this plan is just for construction purposes. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, this is Rick Bush. I have a question through you, Matt. Certainly, please proceed. Um, you had mentioned, the town staff had mentioned that th there would be additional ongoing maintenance scheduled for the future. Could you elaborate on that? Town staff? Um, yes, yeah, so usually what we do after we do something like this is then we like to uh, check it yearly just to see um, how it's doing and how it's building up. So it's not every year we need to go in there and take material out. It's pretty much like every year we'll go in there and we'll see how it's doing and see how fast, if at all, it's accumulating that much and then um, and then go from there. Because now we don't really use a lot of salt and stuff in the roadways that would actually wash into the water courses that would accumulate all the sediment. So we're hoping that it is, it's not gonna be something we need to dredge every year. We'll just, we'll have to monitor it first and then go from there with it. Uh, Commissioner Bush, again, through Matt, um, and, and, and by approving it this year, would, would we thereby be approving future work as well? Ms. Fair? Um, well, uh, yes, I'd like to include that in as part of the application. Well, uh, and I think at that point, Todd, maybe you know, it's just, um, then if I was going to, if we were going to go do something to it, then we'd have to send a letter to your office. Is that how that works? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Todd May, Town Planner, for the record, also designated wetlands agent. Uh, historically, when a project like this has become before our inland wetland and water course agency, um, and there is a scope of continuing work to be conducted in the future, uh, as Ms. Vieira just indicated, uh, usually we'll ask the applicant through the agency to define that scope, narrow it to its you know, minimal uh, amount so there is no future potential impact. So the agency is aware and the applicant's aware of future work that can be authorized under the scope of the permit. It was my understanding that part of the future request for maintenance was just a more defined vegetation maintenance program. So part of the issue here is uh, these are good images that Ms. Vieira has up on the computer now. You can see some fairly excessive vegetation growth. Um, and since there's a pending wetland application, we suggested they include management uh, of, the, of some of the vegetation growth on a yearly basis to prevent uh, some woody vegetation from growing up and further restricting the stream flow, flood flow characteristics of this corridor. Um, so I think that's been defined essentially from uh, the Tungsis Road culvert up to just past the uh, starter shack. Um, just so they'd go in and mow uh, after the season and prevent that woody vegetation from growing. I think that's part of the that annual maintenance activity. I think if there was a plan to go in and uh, perform additional sediment removal, we would have to get a little bit more specified and perhaps we can we can refine that out uh, with the wetlands agency, but it sounds like uh, Mr. Bush and CC might share a similar concern. So if Ms. Vieira is able to address that now, it might be a good time to discuss it. Uh, recognizing uh, Ms. Vieira, if she has a response on that. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't, you know, at this point, I don't really know how much sedimentation would go in there. And yes, um, actually, we did want to maintain the, the vegetation. We, before we even start the work, we wanted to trim the vegetation uh, back on the slopes just so we could actually see where we're working at. But um, I, I don't know how fast the, the uh, sediment, if at all, it will accumulate. Um, but maybe it's just a matter of maintaining the vegetation would be enough and we would be okay with that. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Dumet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Todd Dumet, Town Planner. Uh, through you to Ms. Vieira. Uh, if you could, uh, Ms. Vieira, if you could bring up the cross section you had, I think that might be an informative plan. Um, typically, um, the wetlands agency, uh, if they find this activity to be potentially not significant, they will authorize future maintenance not to exceed uh, the grade or dredging shown on the section. So that locks us into a maximum amount and they'll usually ask the applicant uh, 
to provide a yearly or uh, wherever the inspection frequency that report be transmitted back to the wetlands agency uh, through town staff so they get an indication of that yearly build up. So if they're going in there investigating it on a year by year basis, we can see how the sediments accumulating and that report is provided back. Any additional work uh, would not usually be authorized to exceed uh, the slopes shown here in this section. I don't know if that's something that Ms. Vieira had considered or would be amenable to, but that's typically where the wetlands agency will, will end up on this type of a request. Yep. So this this shows this shows the profile, and as I said, you could see um, the darker straight line. That would be the bottom of the channel, which is a straight gradient from the um, I think it's a 42 inch pipe to this culvert that goes under Buena Vista Road. So yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't want to dredge it anywhere below that line. So basically, from where you see the dashed line above it to that bottom line would be the only. Um, area that we would dredge the material out of. Thank you, Mr. Dume. Thank you, Ms. Vieira. Do we have uh, further questions? Mr. Chairman, uh, Sean Daly, uh, Commissioner, uh, had a couple more questions. Certainly. Please proceed. Um, the application says that there's adverse effects of the wetlands and water course, and I apologize, but um, I've heard the benefits, but what exactly are the adverse effects? Just simply the um, uh, the removal of some of the vegetation, and um, are there any effects? Uh, are there any current effects to any homes in the area? Um, I didn't see that on the on the plans, um, or are there any uh, future effects to homes in the area? Uh, over to town staff, Ms. Veer. Okay, so there's there's no um, bad effects to any residential properties. Um, so right now, the right now in its current state, I guess the bad effects would be the fact that the channel doesn't have the ca the capacity to take the water. So one example is the drawdown, or if we get heavy rain flows, it won't be able to take that water either because the channel is uh, lost its capacity due to the sedimentation and the vegetation, which causes it to flow over the breach, which would cause more erosion, which I guess that's more of a, a bad effect. The, the positive aspect, if we take the dredged material out, is that we're opening up the capacity of the, the channel so that the water will stay in the channel and not overflow the banks. I think I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I may have been unclear about my question. Um, the question more is, is the actions that you're planning to take through this application, would that have any uh, negative effects to the uh, to the wetlands, uh, uh, wetlands or water course area? Uh, before passing along to town staff, I'll just give my own um, shade on that uh, in my less informed perspective. Uh, to your original question, why is this before us? Uh, what is the impact here? Any sort of uh, ground uh, disturbance inside the regulated area essentially comes through us. Um, I, I didn't see neighboring uh, or abutting uh, residential areas, but I could have missed that on the map. Passing it along here to uh, town staff, Ms. Vieira. Um, so we did hire a soil scientist who, uh, and I, I forward it, but I'm not sure if you guys got the report from the, the soil scientist. So uh, it's a channelized water course and it's an excavated pond. Um, I'm just gonna read some stuff from the, the uh, soil report. Um, the soils are classified as aquients, which are man-made or disturbed wet areas um, where the original soil profile cannot be determined. Um, so they're poorly or very drained. Um, there's also a bunch of um, invasive uh, or I should say numerous invasive species in there. Um, he, he had flagged the wetlands and then um, really his final statement in here was with the provision of standard sedimentation erosion control and stabilization, stabilization measures, there's no long-term adverse effect on the wetlands or the water course.
please take a moment to review. And uh, I might have missed this, but uh, uh, my own question here, uh, you said that you would seek to have this done during a uh, dry period of time. So I'm presuming the very near future. Um, Correct. Okay, thank you. All right. Mr. Klein has certainly appeared before this commission before. Um, hold on questions. And don't be shy. You've had the hot hand, Sean. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did have one other question, which is you mentioned that there was going to be a rodent survey. Do you know how soon that rodent survey will be available? How's that? Okay, we're in the process of hiring a, a consultant to do that rodent survey. Um, the, the intent is to have that survey done before um, construction would start. So we're hoping like within the next um, several days or so to hire someone. So Mr. Chairman, Sean Daly, Commissioner, um, are we expected then to vote on this proposal before the, uh, before the survey is complete? I would partially defer to uh, Mr. Dumay on this, but uh, the experience of Conservation Environment Commission and our processes uh, to date have been that uh, we are a referral commission that opines upon uh, inland wetlands and water courses applications to be referred to Town Planning and Zoning Commission, who then uh, takes the actual vote on um, uh, such matters as relates to the application. Uh, am I articulating that correctly, Town Staff? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Todd DeMay, Town Planner, that is correct. Uh, this is scheduled for public hearing with the uh, Planning and Zoning slash Inland Wetland Agency on Wednesday. We will not have another regularly scheduled meeting to uh, take this matter up again before then. If there is something of particular concern, uh, what is very useful and the Wetlands Agency finds helpful is to have specific notes or concerns to be addressed during that hearing process. Uh, they have the ability to condition an application that goes before them uh, with certain um, conditional approvals that can require things like that wetland survey, I'm sorry, the rodent survey uh, to be performed and any you know, uh, actions addressed in it to be reported back to them or to another board and commission in this instance. This is a useful tool for you to communicate any concerns you might have about a particular application to them so they can appropriately review those and possibly add conditions of approval. Does that help, uh, Commissioner Daly? Yes, thank you very much. Certainly. So, Mr. Chairman, it's a Commissioner Ted Newton. Just a follow-up question on the rodent survey. What uh, What is the purpose of the rodent survey and um, what might its uh, results, how, how might the results impact uh, either the decision to dredge or not or how to dredge? Question recognized, referred to town staff. And, um, if there is rodents living there, then we would have to do something about them, whether that's trapping them and moving them or something. I don't know, Dwayne, if you have any information on that. Sure, it's Dwayne Martin, town engineer again. I, I talked to the health district. That's where the comment came in from uh, regarding our application and the concern that has come up recently and is on your agenda with respect to rodents. Uh, I think the fact that we're proposing a dredge in a water course raised some concerns by the health district. So um, I asked essentially, well, what, what is the scope? What's, what is the health district looking for for the town staff to be able to address this concern? And they would like us to hire a professional to go out to the work area so not just the area that would be dredged but we would go beyond that some distance 
they didn't specify an exact distance, but we would probably go, you know, cover the general area a few hundred feet, uh, perhaps in each direction. The uh, the specialists that we would hire would walk the watercourse embankment areas and identify if there are any rodents that are there that would be displaced by the dredging activity. And if they are there, then they would have to produce a plan for us to address that either in advance, more than likely in advance, but um, also potentially during the dredging operation. Um, and then hopefully there isn't an issue from there. So we don't, we don't really know, we're not experts in the field and there is a lot of vegetation along the embankment as Julie indicated. And obviously if we're doing um, a rodent assessment or a pest assessment, we wouldn't mow or propose to mow the embankments until a specialist has had an opportunity to do their work because that could displace the rodents as well. And so the, the hope is to have somebody review the area, produce a report. Hopefully there isn't anything there. If there is, we'll have to come up with their recommendations and implement those before we have the dredging operation so that we don't have a problem there. So to, uh, uh, I think that question came from Commissioner Newton. Think if you have a follow-up right there. I have my own, which is, um, it, it sounds like it comes from town, um, West Harvard Bloomfield Health Department as to the advice on whether or not there is anything to do uh, about rats on a property or if a project simply proceeds with, you know, vermin in place um, because there's no law that says you cannot. Uh, there are potentially public health codes uh, that would recommend against such uh, a process. Is, is that a somewhat accurate understanding um not that anyone wants to uh, necessarily uh, uh build a mid rat infestation but uh, i'm just curious as to what governs that uh to piggyback on commissioner newton's uh earlier question uh was that directed towards uh myself or uh, Todd Dume, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll take all comers, uh, but uh, yourself, Mr. Martin, how's that? Okay, um, I think that essentially because of some of the recent activity with the rats that came in the Fox Meadow neighborhood, that kind of caught the health district a little bit off guard and we weren't really sure what specifically caused it. There was some speculation. I wasn't directly involved, so I was kind of secondhand to the conversations. Um, but I do know that there was con some concern that it might actually have been caused by the North Main Street Bridge, which was another project that the engineering division was involved with. Um, and so I believe the health district is trying to be proactive. And upon my discussions with them about when or not to do assessments in advance of construction activities, it, it really depends. I think they were focusing their efforts on any sorts of demolition projects of size and any uh, excavations of size, particularly ones like this one that could be close to a, a water source because that's where rodents uh, tend to congregate because they need water daily is what I understand. So I think this is proactive. I don't think there's any complaints or problems in that area where we're proposing to do the dredging. Um, and they just, they just want to make sure that we don't have another unexpected issue from this project. Thank you. Further questions on this application? Good. Thank you for your time before us tonight and uh, for appearing before us. I'll, I'll ask you to uh, stick around for the second item as a just in case since uh, there are some tie-ins on there uh, with regards uh, to the vermin issue. Um, otherwise, uh, we will um, duly consider the application before us and uh, pass along our comments to town planning and zoning as per the uh, typical process uh, of the Conservation Environment Commission. Uh, thank you, Ms. Vieira, uh, and thank you for your support, um, Mr. Martin and uh, Mr. Dumais. Uh, agenda item three, if we're counting the minutes as one, um, would be the uh, Yukon property 
uh, which uh, one of our members uh, lives uh, adjacent or near to and which had been in the headlines this past spring um, for uh, a similar um, sort of circumstance. Um, Commissioner Daly, uh, do you specifically have any words that uh, you want to um, uh, or observations that you want to share on that before we uh, move forward to dialogue? Uh, just for introduction purposes. Uh, yes, Tom Daly, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, no, I'm very interested to hear what uh, you said. You have comments from the West Hartford Bloomfield uh, Public Health Commission, so I'm very interested in hearing that. Um, I continue to work with um, and talk to residents within the Yukon area. Um, obviously, some improvements have been made with the town now taking over maintenance of the property. Um, which has uh, which has been helpful, but we're also seeing um, some other things, destruction of the property. There's now um, photos that I have of shopping carts being left in the pond, um, other things that are happening with, um, uh, with the property, which obviously creates a conservation and environmental hazard as well. Um, so, uh, um, you know, I think there are some things that we uh, that fall under the jurisdiction of this commission that we need to look at. Um, but I'm interested in hearing kind of what uh, the West Hartford and uh, West Hartford Bloomfield uh, Public Health Commission has to say. Thank you. Sure. So uh, to that point, um, and I would uh, ask uh, Mr. Martin or Mr. Dume uh, to opine on this as well. Uh, earlier today, I received a communication from West Hartford Bloomfield Health District updating on the status of that property, would I be within bounds uh, to simply uh, read that brief excerpt um, verbatim to the commission in this forum, or uh, would there be a preference that uh, town staff summarize instead? And, and no answer uh, equals uh, I will proceed based on my own judgment. Uh, this is Dwayne, the town engineer. I was waiting for Todd to jump in to respond. Um, I thought he was going to, but I'm not not seeing him. Uh, so. uh, for the record, Todd to me, town planner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it, it's probably best that you read that communication from the director of, of the West Harbor Bluefield Health, Health District. It's relatively short and concise, but um, sharing that, I can try to pull up the email on the screen as well while you're doing that. Sure. Um, so this is from uh, Director of Health for West Harbor Bloomfield Health District uh, responding to our inquiry that uh, we were wondering about um, the uh, headline issue of uh, rats on the former Yukon property as that property had been in an unmowed status. Uh, the response was that uh, the health district staff had walked the property last month, so that would be July. Uh, they did not see evidence of rodents at that point in time. They checked around the building foundations that were accessible and in some of the grassy areas. Also spoke to an officer that was parked there, uh, and he said he hadn't seen anything while he was there. Uh, in the health district's opinion, uh, there is no food source on the property that would attract rodents to the area and really no harborage other than the tall grass. Um, normally, they would see rodent burrows in dirt areas and less in tall grass areas. Uh, the complaints they've gotten from the surrounding neighborhood also seem to have slowed down. Um, this following from um, the mowing that uh, town, I understand, had taken over on that property. Several residents have had extermination on their properties at this point. Uh, the last visit to the neighborhood on Fox Meadow Road was on July 20th. Uh, the neighbors that had been spoken to said they hadn't seen any rats in about a month uh, at that point in time. Uh, so that is the report from the health district. Are there uh, follow-ups that any commission members um, would like to pass along or information that um, they would further be seeking on this matter uh, from the health district or from potentially other sources? Uh, Commissioner, pleasure for you, Matt. Um, yes, sir. Just, just to clarify some some rumor, maybe that was being disseminated through the community. Um, I, I heard and understood that possibly the rat problem was simply due to the fact that so many restaurants had closed, that the food source for the rats had diminished, and they were out looking for additional sources of food. Is there any credibility to that? 
uh, that anyone's aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will open it up for dialogue to whoever has a response to that because I am not um, positioned with any sort of knowledge that could be relied upon uh, to address that question. Uh, Commissioner, this is uh, our uh, chairman. This is uh, Commissioner Sean Daly. I'd like to respond. Please proceed. Yeah, so um, I think um, I, I haven't heard uh, that rumor except from um, uh, uh, Commissioner Bush. Um, and my understanding is is that um, uh, the property was uh, had started last year actually with uh, removal of debris by um, fintech IDnomics and um, the uh, the rat issue or the rodent issue began um, prior to uh, the pandemic starting. So I, I'm I, I'm I'm just saying that it's possible. That that may be an explanation for the um, for the exacerbation of the problem, but I don't think it was the initial cause of the problem because there's no correlation to when uh, the shutdown started versus when the rodent problem started. Interesting. Does anyone else have information that could shed light on the subject? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Todd DeMay, Tom Planner, uh, if, if there is interest by the CEC, uh, this commission in this topic, um, uh, perhaps at your next meeting, we could invite the West Hartford Bloomfield Health District. Uh, the director could assign an appropriate staff member to come and report on, on both this particular parcel and the, the problem that occurred in this neighborhood, but more broadly speaking on the issue of rodent infestation in town and they, how they handle and uh, investigate those complaints when they are brought up from time to time. I think most frequently they're linked to our commercial districts and that's probably their greatest area of expertise, but I think it would be best to hear from them if that's really a, something that everyone's interested in. We can certainly arrange that. Uh, on behalf of members and seeing no objections, uh, I think there would be interest there. Yes. Fantastic. And anything else on uh, this agenda item? Mr. Martin. Thank you, Dwayne Martin, Town Engineer. Um, I, it's not quite related to, to Rook's, uh, Rick's question, excuse me, but it's on topic. I know that the um, West Hartford Finance Director is trying to secure a company through an RFP or RFQ process, a pest control company, to allow the town to be able to do uh, pest assessments in advance of a town project or perhaps offer it to a contractor that's doing work in town, whether it's a demolition or significant excavation, as I mentioned. Um, so I know that they're trying to put that um, consultant in place to be used. I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, perhaps Mr. Bush, Bush's feline friend could uh, respond to that RFP. Uh, looked capable of handling some uh, rodent. <laughs> Uh, you're on mute. I, I missed it if there was a cameo, though. Oh, I don't know how to unmute. It's unmute anymore. No rats on my house. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Excellent. Um, no objections. Uh, let's proceed to agenda item. Three, four, if we're counting the minutes. Um, for, mean, this, for this sorry, matter. I just figured out how to unmute, though. So I was saying there's definitely no rats. My cats are good. <laughs> sorry for the interruption. We'll, we'll, we'll take the recommendation, <laughs> and it shall be noted. Uh, I'm going to try screen sharing. I uh, whipped together a brief slide deck here just to help. Um, let's see. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. This is item three C. Discussion of uh, export uh, of exploration of electrification. The chair recognizes Commissioner Daly and affirms. Sorry.
Are people seeing it? Yes. Thank you. So uh, at my own peril here, because uh, much of this is unscripted, uh, <laughs> I, I am introducing for uh, consideration uh, to the Conservation Environment Commission um, the an idea that had been proposed to me by uh, several other individuals, either uh, who live in West Hartford or who also volunteer with the Town uh, Clean Energy Commission. Um, and it is one that does seem to, in my opinion so far, uh, fall within our purview. Um, and so uh, I want to bring it forward uh, to the commission for their own uh, judgments on this matter um, in terms of uh, potential paths forward. Um, if commission members have uh, questions or observations, I suppose I would encourage them to make them in real time um, by, uh, I suppose, uh, calling, uh, going off of mute and calling a point of order and being recognized uh, rather than saving them for the end. Um, so the matter that I'm interested in bringing forward to the commission is that of alternative fuel vehicles and specifically um, electrification of a uh, contracted school bus fleet in a phased approach over time. Um, this owing to uh, the commission's um, purview over uh, air quality matters in town, uh, as well as uh, how environment uh, affects uh, the public health um, and aesthetic of the town. Um, there is a great volume of documented uh, material out there. I could share as follow up if required that uh, diesel exhaust um, is a uh, negative factor in uh, human health outcomes, uh, either through particulate matter or through other uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the uh, possibility of uh, electric school buses um, would have been too far remote to even discuss this, uh, even as recently as, let's say, five years ago, uh, even three years ago. Uh, the market has developed. Uh, there are multiple uh, domestic U.S.-based uh, electric school bus manufacturers out there, including the manufacturers of uh, the major um, existing school buses out there. They're run on uh, uh, diesel or propane or other fuels as well. They are now um, manufacturing uh, zero emission buses uh, and thereby uh, not emitting any greenhouse gas or uh, noxious fumes for uh, children, parents, etc., uh, to be exposed to around our neighborhoods. So uh, the concept here is to, as I'm proposing it, uh, not to be overly activist about it and say, uh, let's uh, transition the full fleet by next year, uh, cost regardless. Uh, I I'm trying to seek out uh, a moderate ground uh, to position us for on this. And that would be to uh, get us to a place of comfort whereby um, we would take this concept and uh, establish a working group in tandem with other interested parties, volunteers, either throughout the community or uh, the Clean Energy Commission and uh, advance concepts to um, the Town Board of Education uh, for their uh, edification on this and uh, their own decision-making process in terms of the creation of, since West Hartford has a third-party contract of buses and does not own it, uh, it is limited in its options, the creation of um, an RFP during the next cycle, uh, which comes up, uh, my impression is, uh, later in 2022, um, so that uh, certain provisions can be written into there, giving the town enough flexibility that it may, if it so chooses, and if it's within uh, cost uh, neutrality or cost parameters, uh, so it's determined by the board, that they may uh, decide to have that third party bus contractor uh, add in such an innovation option into their bid um, so as to phase in uh, it, the uh, approach uh, for electric school bus deployment. They are very much more expensive uh, than traditional buses. A traditional school bus, I'm going off the top of my head here, it might be 90,000, whereas one of these could be 
180,000. I could be off on the numbers there, but it's about that order of magnitude difference. Um, the delta in between those two are most often uh, made up with through uh, three different grant funds. Uh, the EPA has uh, its low no uh, carbon grants. Uh, there is Diesel Emission Reduction Act, DERA uh, grants that are administered by uh, state DEP. And there's also administered by state DEP, uh, the Volkswagen Emissions Cheating uh, Scandal uh, Settlement Funds. Um, most of those uh, throughout um, the US and I believe also in Connecticut up to 80% haven't been spent yet. Um, and so there are successive rounds through which uh, diesel buses or other uh, diesel equipment can be retired and replaced uh, with less emitting uh, equipment moving forward. Those sorts of grants uh, would be exactly the opportunity that we might look to a third party bus contractor to be pursuing uh, as it proposes in uh, to West Hartford to be deploying uh, an alternative fuel vehicle so that the taxpayers of West Hartford uh, aren't on the hook for additional burden as a result of that fuel shift. Uh, there's also uh, potentially uh, ancillary services that could be provided. Um, the, I, I tend to have some expertise in the energy sector, so uh, frankly, um, this is a little bit wonky, but uh, bus, electric school buses, or rather school buses, have a perfect duty cycle for um, being employed as power grid assets because they're mostly dormant um, during set periods of time that are known. And those batteries uh, are kind of at the grid edge and can be uh, dispatched and called upon uh, by a utility or a third party administrator of that utility uh, to be performing some uh, voltage regulation, frequency regulation um, uh, services uh, to do load balancing essentially, to feed back into the grid, be one of those assets during a hot summer day so that you don't have to turn on a power plant Instead, you call upon a thousand diffuse resources around Connecticut uh, in an energy efficiency sense or in a battery storage sense and call upon them so as to not need to turn on that one extra power plant, which in turn uh, would cause extra rates uh, or rate increases and in costs borne by electric rate payers if you did have to turn on that just based on market dynamics. Um, so getting a little wonky there for the moment. and. Um, you know, there is a, a, another state entity aside from DEP, the Connecticut Green Bank, full disclosure. I work for them, so I know a little bit about this. Uh, we don't have a necessarily a product to sell about this, so I, I feel my bases are covered there. But I just want to uh, say that the uh, balance sheet of the Green Bank could be made available for an innovative financing of this sort as well, because it falls under that clean energy rubric as defined in statute. Um, on an emissions basis, uh, this is uh, taken from International Council for Clean Transportation. The items to pay attention to are the leftmost two bars for conventional vehicles and then the single rightmost bar for uh, US. So uh, this study was done in Europe. So assume that conventional vehicles in the US have even higher bar stacks uh, in terms of emissions. Uh, what you're seeing here is uh, a wells to wheel basis involving all the inputs to a vehicle, um, showing that electrics do come out substantially cleaner uh, when taking in uh, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions intensity. A conventional car uh, is on the far left. A uh, hybrid best in class car would be next to that. And then on the far right, is what an uh, average EV would look like in the US. So tailpipe emissions are in gray. Uh, orange is the emissions from the fuel cycle, which includes oil production, transport, refining, and also for EVs, electricity generation. So it depends on where you're at. Uh, the dark blue is emissions from the manufacturing of non-battery components in a vehicle. So that's pretty level, uh, regardless of what you're looking at there. And then the light blue, also pretty level, is an estimate of the emissions from the manufacturing of the battery, since uh, there is emissions uh, coming from there. The box and whisker plots above it, I uh, do believe would represent the variability right there with the bar charts coming off in the middle. Um, this is from Union of Concerned Scientists. 
really making the point that um, the environmental merits exist uh, for electrification of transportation. Really, this is about passenger vehicles. I'm just using this as a proxy for uh, the heavy duty segment for which this would be even uh, a more intense effect. But uh, what it shows here is the emissions equivalent from an average EV, and it's differentiated by the power plant region that fuels it, according to EPA data. Uh, in New England, where we fuel mostly with nuclear and natural gas, the average electric vehicle has the emissions equivalent of a car that gets 100 miles per gallon. Uh, so no matter which way you cut it here, an electric vehicle uh, would be an improvement based on life cycle emissions and mobile source emissions uh, for the environment. And if you drive one of the most efficient EVs right there, since this is just average, that could be 50% higher, actually. It'd be closer to 150 miles per gallon equivalent. And importantly, as power grids get cleaner over time, as more renewables come online, uh, driving electric gets cleaner over time. Uh, whereas driving conventional vehicles, the moment you roll it out of the factory and it kind of comes off of its tuning, uh, they get dirtier over time as their uh, emission systems uh, start to need tune-ups. Um, so anyways, uh, I could proceed on this. Uh, there's uh, a robust discussion uh, or body of literature out there about um, the harm of diesel exhaust for human health. Um, so I, I think the underpinnings are in place here for it to be considered um, an environmental good at the very least. Um, our current vendor in town is First Student. Uh, it's the largest one around the country. Uh, so they have our current RFP cycle. Uh, these are the current bus yards in town. Um, by the uh, New Park Avenue uh, industrial slash post-industrial area. Uh, I, interesting note here, I don't know and town staff can feel free to interrupt me. I don't know if the town keeps these properties uh, once a new vendor comes in and uses them, but I have noticed um, that they are right adjacent to the CT Fast Track busway. The DOT is looking to uh, electrify and make autonomous potentially uh, some of their rolling stock in a phased approach over the coming decade. Um, and the CT Fast Track busway as a closed system uh, is pretty perfect for that. And I have heard that from DOT staff. And so they would be looking uh, toward a electrification of this route here directly adjacent to the school bus plot. I've also noticed, um, I, I was snapping some pictures while walking my dog and then I, I showed it to someone and they told me what it was. Uh, Eversource uh, has a uh, Newington to Hartford reliability project with some tall transmission towers uh, that were installed on a several mile stretch right adjacent to the fast track busway as well. So between that and the DOT, uh, that makes me wonder about the potential for uh, pressuring down, uh, say, the integration costs of having to charge uh, electric buses where we might be able to coordinate with them uh, to share the utility service upgrades. Uh, final point here, there is an example uh, that has been done before. Uh, so a town of Fairfield put out for uh, its, uh, let's see if the, Bidding, yeah, the bidding happened uh, also in 2019 uh, for its bus RFP and its uh, cycle. And so it established that there could be uh, certain other alternative options proposed in uh, to uh, the school busing uh, in town offered by third parties. And that's that the town could specify, in this case it did, uh, that it wanted to receive price options for uh, electric buses with a certain amount of range. They were specifying 60 miles to 125 miles, as that would uh, cover everything with redundancy in terms of town um, uh, circulated routes. And uh, they wrote that into their RFP. And so that's why, as uh, when I started this, I said I wasn't going to pressure us to decide tomorrow to trans, uh, uh, transform the entire West Hartford bus fleet uh, to electric. Uh, it would have to be done in due order of process and with all uh, relevant parties weighing in and deciding that it's a good idea. And then uh, getting to this as a potential end goal, which is since we contract out for electric buses, add in some form of innovation option 
for alternative fuel vehicles uh, to be participating in there uh, at the election of the town, uh, say Board of Ed or um, uh, uh, town staff or other decision makers in the matter. Uh, so as to whether or not to accept those bids, if they're in the best interest of uh, not only those who breathe the air of West Hartford, but also those who pay the taxes, right? And, and so uh, the costs, let's see, I don't have a firm sense of uh, what was bid in with them, although I did get an update recently. Um, what they allowed for was two, oh, well, it's actually right here, uh, two buses a year, uh, which makes four over a five-year contract up to 10 buses out of the entirety of the fleet, uh, which we saw on the previous slide, you know, tends to be more than 10 buses for a comparably sized municipality. Um, and that would be contingent on a provider taking the initiative to make that offer attractive enough to the town to accept that. So that's my presentation with regards to the, uh, the possibility of electrifying uh, town bus fleet. I'm going to try figuring out how to switch from off of the screen share here and uh, open it up for discussion, questions, uh, comments. Mr. Chairman, it's uh, Ted Newton, Commissioner. Um, thank you for that overview. That's really um, gives us a lot to think about. One of the questions I have, and, and just for full disclosure, I've always hated the <laughs> emissions of buses, whether it's school buses or uh, city buses or whatever. And uh, having lived and worked in Washington, D.C., where many tourist bus would sit idle in the summer, um, just spewing uh, diesel exhaust into the air, I can tell you that when uh, D.C. passed uh, a law, it probably was 25 years ago, to require buses to not idle more than, I don't know, two or three minutes, um, it made a huge difference in the, in the freshness of the air, just walking around some of the more uh, areas that were concentrated with, with school buses. Also, uh, full disclosure, I am um, currently uh, still a proud owner of one of the VWs that was <laughs> recalled um, over five years ago for the um, diesel exhaust. And had I known at the time when I purchased what was called a clean energy vehicle and even got a state reward for doing so, I not well, would not have uh, purchased it, but um, it has been retrofitted and hopefully is uh, putting a little bit less uh, diesel exhaust into the air. In any case, what I'm trying to say is that there's, um, I, I'm all for this, I guess, from a philosophical standpoint, from a practical standpoint, there's so many considerations and things that might get in the way. What, what can we do as a commission now um, to um, perhaps address the, the noxiousness of the diesel fumes that doesn't require replacing the fleet, whether it's immediately or over time with electric buses. Is there something that we can do in terms of putting in uh, rules around, uh, and I don't mean the commission itself, but the town uh, writing into its contract, rules around idling, for example, um, purchasing um, new buses that have cleaner technology, even if it's not uh, electric, um, technology. Uh, you mentioned propane, and I know that there is a number of fleets that have propane as their primary source. How does propane compare? So just a couple of questions that came up, and I thought, given your background, you probably would be able to provide some um, good good information around those, those questions. And Matt, you're still on mute, I think. All right, I, I said what I actually thought, and now I'll say the diplomatic part. Um, so uh, those are great points, though, uh, Ted. There are uh, anti-idling laws in Connecticut, although we are not exactly a tourist capital as Central D.C. is, and so, you know, the, the enforcement on those are here and there. Um, we haven't uh, taken up that issue as a commission, actually, but uh, you make a good point there. Um, it's, Setting aside uh, uh, COVID and uh, uh, whatever uncertainties and items I don't know about this fall in terms of a busing regimen and how operational these actually will be, um, you know, what can we do in uh, other regards to what you said? You know, 
there are other alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, propane probably is uh, the most popular alternative fuel to diesel out there. I don't know what steps up on diesel technology exist uh, to mitigate the particulate emissions, uh, the nitrogen oxide, et cetera, um, to the same degree that other alternative fuels do. Propane gets rid of, uh, I would misstate it uh, as we're on the record uh, as to whether it's uh, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, or sulfur oxide. Uh, my impression is that it is good for reducing one or two out of three of those. There's a third one that it increases. Uh, and so there is uh, a potent greenhouse gas that it potentially also puts out, which uh, gives it sometimes mixed environmental reviews as a result. Um, the, the reason there tends to be, um, you know, uh, the issue du jour of electrification more recently as the technologies come up the uh, development cycle is that it doesn't have any form of mobile source emissions. And so it gets rid of all three of those key um, uh, ozone and greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, that come from uh, that. Um, other uh, commissioners absolutely feel free to weigh in uh, either in response to Commissioner Newton or with your own questions. Uh, yeah, I've seen, uh, uh, this is Sean, uh, Commissioner Sean Daly, uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Please proceed. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of thoughts on this. Um, I think, you know, we just, it, it seems on the surface like a good idea, but I think we need to, um, you know, th we're only seeing one side of this. Um, I think there are, uh, there's another side um, that we need to study further. Um, you know, in a recent uh, edition of Wired, uh, July 2019, um, they recognize that when you look at a electric bus, you're not just buying electric buses, you have to buy into an electric bus system because they constantly have to be charged, which means you're having to not, it's not just the cost of the bus, which chairman recognizes is a significant higher cost. You're also having to buy into the system of charging stations um, in order to uh, charge the systems. And they have a huge drain on our power grid. Uh, in fact, um, the article recognizes that a typical electric bus will use 150 megawatt hours per day. You compare that to an average household that uses 10 and a half megawatt hours per year. So when we talk about the issues that we have with Eversource, you're talking about now bringing on a very significant, if all towns in the state start to move to an electric bus system, you're starting to talk about a huge strain to the power grid, which means you have to create more fuel for the electricity to power the electric vehicles which means you're looking at coal, nuclear, other sorts of power that cause the same smog problems as the diesel uh, and gas fuel vehicles. So while there may be, you know, we're looking for revenue neutral, you end up, you could end up having a uh, environmentally neutral um, system by uh, changing. And if so, then what is the exact advantage? In addition, um, there's also studies that are showing that the buses, electric buses are almost as environmentally harmful. Um, in fact, uh, in October 2019, The Verge had an article and cited that without proper recycling of the, line, uh, of the uh, um, lithium ion batteries that uh, electric vehicles have, like the ones in buses, um, it can lead to huge mountains of waste. And in fact, in a chemical engineering news article in July 2019, they noticed that um, there is huge harmful emissions that occur from the smelting of trying to recycle these um, uh, these lithium ion batteries. So um, I just think, and then there are issues that I won't uh, get into for time's sake uh, with propane use and there's dangers with propane. So I, I would say that we need to tread lightly into, uh, into this area, um, especially when you have situations where, right, we know we have budget issues. We know that, uh, and we know that we need to be careful about increasing costs for something that could be um, environmentally and revenue neutral for us. Um, we need to also think about, um, you know, whether or not this does add an advantage for uh, town residents. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, all important input. And you gave me a great idea, but I'm not going to voice it yet. I want more input. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just recognize the second time, Commissioner Daly. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if this is your idea, but I, I'd like to see someone from the gas, you know, from the gas powered vehicle buses to um, to maybe present on why we should maintain our current fleet that we're. So you're taking credit for my great idea now. Uh, yes, uh, that was what that was what I was thinking um, is maybe we can get some future um, uh, meeting of ours to invite on several different fuel purveyors uh, for these um, uh, school transportation, uh, starting with, um, you know, the Petroleum Council or, uh, you know, gas station retailers, whoever best represents that angle, um, the uh, um, Propane Council, uh, of Connecticut, if I'm getting a name right there, um, maybe even Eversource uh, as the fuel purveyor for electricity and who could also talk about the grid infrastructure um, needs and upgrades if there are any for that uh, type of improvement. Um, you've got me in my zone here, so I am gonna correct the stat. I think you meant kilowatt hours before, not megawatt hours. That'd be a lot of power plants. Um, <laughs> I'll send you the article, uh, Matt. It does say megawatt hours. I'll take the article. I'm interested. Okay. Um, so that I like that idea uh, of hearing everybody out on this matter. But uh, before we uh, potentially foreclose that, uh, are there other thoughts on it um, based on presentation and dialogue thus far? Everyone's good with uh, that manner of process? All right, you bought us time, Commissioner Daly. Um, that closes out our formal agenda items, um, open for uh, discussions on other future items of interest for CEC. Uh, this was not on the formal agenda, but I do want to uh, reiterate something that I had uh, mentioned in our informal. It's been a long time uh, since we've uh, been open to any sort of officer elections with the CEC. We've had a number of new members. Uh, so if there is that sort of expression of interest, we can keep that open for uh, future meetings, uh, remainder of the year, certain uh, interval of time to be determined. Uh, send me uh, a note or send the entire commission a note, whatever your prerogative, if there's any particular interest from any of you uh, in the positions of, um, well, I'll take my guidance from town staff on this, but in the past, there's been a president, there's been a vice president, and potentially the flex position of secretary uh, uh, who tends to take notes, which we've rotated on instead. Uh, and which in this era of video chat uh, might be an anachronism in itself. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would just want to leave that with you that um, the possibility exists uh, for others to be uh, jumping into uh, officer positions here as it's generally been uh, open for the past number of years. So um, do feel free to send me any expressions of uh, interest regarding that. Uh, I have no further items for the agenda, but I leave open uh, for anybody else here if there's uh, other items to share. Reading stony silence as a no. Uh, I thank everybody for their time tonight uh, for Conservation and Environment Commission meeting dated August 31st, 2020. Uh, this closes out our, uh, if I'm doing this right, our formal record uh, for tonight's meeting. I thank everybody for joining us here tonight and uh, stay safe on your way home. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.